Welcome to another episode of Address the Yes, where you guys ask the questions and I answer them a little bit more in depth than a comment or a reply otherwise could handle. But first things first, we're gonna talk about the heat gun method where in a recent video, I got a lot of, I guess, not hate, but a lot of criticism about the heat gun and the fact that it doesn't work. And I know all the arguments surrounding it. And the thing is though, I'm one of those guys who just does trial and error. And over the course of cooking up many of these cards, I've now had the second card that's come back to life. And the previous card that I had come back to life was a 7870 and that's still going to this date years later. So this method, it can very rarely bring a card back to life. Now, a lot of the times as we saw in even the recent video, if you haven't seen that, I'll put the link up here. We had two cards that came back to life, but then pretty much cocked it pretty quickly and that they wouldn't work after I gave them even just a couple of minutes of stress testing. That's probably the most likely scenario, but it still doesn't take away from the fact that I've got nothing to lose when I cook these cards up because I can't micro solder for Jack. And if the card's worth enough money, then I'm gonna keep it aside and take it over to Taiwan or try and get it fixed at a service center. So basically when we're dealing with these cards, for instance, a GTX 650, I wouldn't pay money for like 25 USD because that's what it costs to fix at the service center. I wouldn't pay that to fix this card because it's just simply not worth it. And also on top of that, the amount of time and effort it would take to fix this thing, even if I knew how to micro solder, I just feel wouldn't be worth it. But hopefully that clears the air surrounding the heat gun method. And just really, it's basically, as I said before, when you've got nothing to lose, you've got nothing to lose. The next question we got up here is from Vegemite Dangerous. He says, my dude, I recently got a new case and a bunch of RGB fans. However, my board is an older Gigabyte H81M. I cannot figure out how to wire up all these RGB fans as the MOBO doesn't have any RGB headers. They're really only on motherboards that are new motherboards in the last couple of years. A H81M definitely won't have these headers on board where you can control them via the motherboard software. In the case of ASRock, you can control them within the BIOS. However, the manufacturer of those RGB fans should include a, a connector and an adapter with some sort of controller. And you wanna hook all those RGB components up to that controller and control those RGB fans without having to install any software at all. Next up here, we've got Vikings are better. He says, it's still not hustling. Please look up the term. Well, I actually did look it up on dictionary.com and some of the terms do definitely apply to what I do. The most relative one being sell aggressively. Basically the tech yes hustle ain't going anywhere. Next up here, I'm gonna say Marco's finally getting some love this year. People are saying Marco is the man. If he can't do it, no one can. And also we got Judge Dredd says, hope his last name is Polo. Awesome name. Marco Polo was definitely happy with all the love that you guys showed him in some of the recent videos. Next up here, we've got a heap of comments pertaining to Zen 2. And these were months ago, but now that we know the announcements and what's coming, we can definitely talk about this also Navi a little bit more in depth. Now, JD Gaming says it's gonna be 4.4 to 4.7 gigahertz max turbo with seven to 10% higher IPC. So we saw with the IPC, they said it was 15%. And in terms of the clock speeds, that's still up in the air. Me personally, I'm focused on the all core maximum clock speeds. And I think they're gonna be anywhere from four to 4.4 gigahertz. It remains to be seen how well these things clock on all cores. But in terms of JD Gaming's comment, he got the 4.7 gigahertz max turbo bingo with the 3950X. So nice speculation there. Next up here, Sir Brucey asks, after Ryzen 3000 launch, then you will see the is Ryzen 5 1600 still a good buy in 2020. I called it watch and see they will be found for great prices too. Actually, as soon as Ryzen comes out to the market, Zen 2, I'm gonna be doing some deal hunts because I think a lot of people will want to upgrade, not just to the new Zen 2 CPUs, but also to X570 as well. So stay tuned for some deal hunts. It's not gonna be 2020, it's gonna be 2019. Next up, Mr. Sushi Gaming says, Zen 2 and Navi come out soon. I've been waiting to build my PC ever since Pascal came out. And finally, when I was ready, this is announced why. Uh, basically, Zen 2 is a big upgrade for enthusiasts. I spoke with Wendell about this and we both agree it's a great time for PC gamers, on, especially on the CPU side where you've got the tick and the talk happening at the exact same time with this new CPU launch. So it's gonna be great and a good time to build a new PC as well as also getting used deals since hopefully these CPUs will bring the price down 
of the used market. But in terms of Navi and what we can expect out of AMD, I think it's a little bit too unrealistic to see them come out and beat Nvidia. I mean, Nvidia is a GPU focused company. All their R&D goes into improving their graphics cards. And so they are quite a bit ahead of AMD, especially before the Navi announcement. But coming out of Navi, we do have to remember that this is a company that has less R&D money than Nvidia, but still has to do system on chip, CPU and GPU. So expecting them to pull a Hail Mary on the GPU side of things is a little bit too much considering they already pulled a Hail Mary on the CPU side of things. But when it comes to giving you guys buying advice on these new products, you can expect nothing but objectivity. If Navi is not gonna perform as well as Nvidia's cards, then I'm just gonna call it how it is or vice versa. If Navi ends up having some great features that are worthwhile and worth the cost, then I'm definitely gonna say that as well. So stay tuned for all those reviews coming up, but we can already expect Zen 2 to be hitting really hard, especially since the Ryzen 5 2600, for example, is already an amazing value for money CPU option. Next up, Quanglu96 says, Threadripper 1920X is like $300 now, 12 cores, 24 threads for $300. Imagine that. And I'm actually more of a buff of the 2000 series. For instance, I'd rather have a 2700X over a 1920X, but just because it clocks better, it has the latency drop, and of course the motherboard side of things, it's gonna be a lot cheaper to get an X470 motherboard than it is to get an X399 board. The next up, Wayne Watson says, for editing a 1080 Ti for CUDA cores or an RTX 2060. I think the big one you're missing here, Wayne, is actually the 1080 Ti by a long shot, and that's because of the VRAM. The 11 gigabytes of VRAM I've found makes a big difference for video editors. I've tried an RTX 2060 and I've actually tried a 1080 Ti. And also for gaming too, the 1080 Ti is a better play, but it does cost more, even on the used market versus a new 2060. Next up here, we've got Ratchet who says land suggestions pertaining to the previous episode where we talked about maybe hosting a Tech yes, City LAN and the game suggested were Half-Life 2, CNC, L4D2, CS1.6 and BD2. CS1.6 is really cool with the uh, land feature. I also like StarCraft Brood War, but I don't know if they took that out or if you can get the original uh, sort of vanilla brood war where it did have that LAN connectivity. But basically playing over LAN guys gives you the lowest pings possible. It is really a awesome experience that I'd like to see that feature actually come back into some of these titles that are being released to this date. But on the flip side, Meoith the second says, don't do a LAN party, go to LTX and LAN party there. Plus meet the other content providers who are planning on going to it. Actually, on that note, I did meet Luke over at Computex. Got a photo with him, put that up on Instagram. Also had lunch with him. He was talking to me about Floatplane, and I didn't get an invitation to LTX, but of course, if I got an invitation, I'd definitely go there and meet up with a lot of you guys who I'm sure would be there too. And if there was a LAN party, then yeah, I'd do that as well. But I never got that invite. Next up, Weird Shitake Mushroom Production says, Love your videos, and OG Battlefield 2 is the best game to land. It's basically the biggest game that we land at school. Actually, that's actually true. BF2 was a really good game for LAN as well. Forgot that one. Next up, Bird Flu Japan says, Any chance you could double the size of the comments on the videos with a 5-inch cell phone? You need to push your eyes to the limits. PS, nothing wrong with a game of CNC Red Alert on LAN. Uh, Bird Flu, your wish is my command. We shall double the comment size so you guys on smartphones can read them easier. Next up, FBI Lolicon Division says, If they can beat, he's referring to AMD, Intel and single core performance, they'll have a lot of new customers. That would be really cool if AMD could come out on top as not just the value leader, but also the performance leader. That would really make for some interesting times. We're talking 2005 all over again. Peter Jensen says, I highly recommend you to invest in a better headphone first before you consider buying a DAC and amplifier. I use a HD 700 Sennheiser. Trust me, that headphone does a lot more than a DAC and amplifier. As Brian says, audio is about the entire chain and what the weakest link is in that chain. Frankly, your headphones are probably the weak link right now. And Peter's right, guys, always invest in the headphones first. And some of my favorite picks, especially in terms of mid-range cans, are actually the Fidelio L1s and L2s. I really like these headphones. For instance, I was on a flight 14 hours coming back from the US. I had my L2s on the whole time and my ears did not get sore at all. They're actually really comfortable for sleeping too, where I blocked out a lot of the outside noises. So definitely invest in a good pair of cans, especially since the motherboard onboard audio nowadays has gotten really good to the point where a power 
a lot of these mid-range cans absolutely fine. And of course, if you want to step it up to something like HD 700, then you may wish to get a DAC and amp amplifier. We're still on that note, you can get something really good for around $200 that won't break the bank in terms of price relative to your headphones. Next up here, Tony Hannes says, I too would like to see that Mars story. And actually when we looked at the Azus video that we did at uh, Combitex, I hinted at the end, I put in an Easter egg, we were talking about the Mars cards and how I acquired a 780 Ti Mars, which is just ridiculously rare. And I want to make a documentary and you guys, the response was overwhelming. You guys really want to see that happen. But keep in mind, I'm not promising anything anytime soon. I've still got to get some pieces to fix up the actual core content. And then of course I got to make a documentary, which I've never made before. And so this one's going to be a pretty long journey because I want to get it right. It's just a fascinating story. The more information I find out about this, the more it goes down different rabbit holes. And the fact that the Mars cards themselves are just an awesome collection is something worth a documentary. It really is interesting. I can't wait to get more pieces to the puzzle and also do more research and just bring you guys something that will hopefully be like an hour long and just be absolutely epic. But it is going to take a lot of time. I do warn that in advance. Kind of think of it maybe like Darth Jar Jar. Well, actually, maybe not that long, but hey, at least I end up delivering in the end. And here we've got Elder Pa, a regular on the channel. He says, great video. The yes man answering the important questions. Still waiting on the BIOS overclock tutorial. And I think he's referring to actually overclocking a BIOS itself, which wouldn't be recommended since uh, you would be reducing the life of those BIOS chips. And if you see on LGA 775, maybe underclocking a BIOS might be a good thing. Next up, Joel Quinn Permi says, yeah, I'm on a video of one of my favorite YouTubers. You can be on it again. Tech Yes Loving knows no bounds. And that about wraps up this episode of Address the Yes. If you guys enjoyed this one, then you know what to do. Smash that like button for us. Also let us know in the comment section below if you have a question that you need some Tech Yes Loving administered to, and I'll make that happen in the next episode for you guys. Also, sorry if I missed out a couple of questions. The last few months have just been absolutely hectic here on the channel. It's been so busy, especially recently coming off Computex and also doing the AMD event in the USA. Those things were like coupled together and that was just absolute chaos in terms of my sleep schedule, jet lag, being super busy, packing in a massive schedule. But you guys along the way have been supporting us left, right and center. I just wanna give you guys a massive thank you before I close this episode out. And also if you're enjoying the content enough, may wish to hit that subscribe button ring the bell or check us out on Instagram, Tech Yes City to get the inside scoop before it even hits YouTube's loop. And I'll catch you guys in another tech video very soon. Peace out for now, bye. Next up here, Operton Prime says, thank you Tech Yes City, you're freaking awesome. Love your content. You guys are breathtaking. <laughs>